So the first question, why is Revelation written in such a cryptic style? Wouldn't it be easier to have a more straightforward language to convey a message on such an important topic as end times? Do you want to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> it was my question. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded familiar. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think ultimately that question, of course, is always kind of answered by, well, you know, the Holy Spirit has decided to do that, and we don't kind of get, again, you know, a straightforward answer, just like how Revelation isn't a straightforward book. But apocalyptic literature is meant, you know, in a very emotive way, you know, it's not poetry, but like it is meant to move people. And we're losing our camera. <laughs> the little man's taking it away. He wants, uh, say, this looks like fun. Yeah, it's, it's, it's meant to really, for people who are going through a lot of pressure, you know, the difficulty of life that the Jewish, uh, the, the Jews were under in those last 200 years when it was developed and in the early Christian church, it was a very difficult time, and so this emotive language that is filled with a lot of imagery uh, fits with their context to kind of comfort them and make them feel secure. So I think it's a really much a response to being uh, like a, a persecuted group and kind of helps to obviously alleviate the difficulty of their life that they're in. Um, I think that's predominantly uh, a big reason why that type of literature would be chosen. I guess my question then is more for like its relevancy today because I can see how in that time it would have been the format that would be most mm -hmm. received the best reception but for us in today's day and age you know dragons and you know swords don't exactly like yeah. are not exactly our straightforward language and I think that's because it's not really written for us today I mean, people have tend to approach Revelation, I think, today to be like, okay, what's going to happen in the end times or something? It's like, that's not really the point. The main point of the book of Revelation is to comfort Christians in persecution and remind them, hey, I know it's bad. It's even going to get worse, but God will win in the end. He will bring deliverance, right? That's the message. It's not to really piece together so that you can predict the future. And so if we kind of remember that, we can kind of see that, yes, there are a lot of elements that don't make sense to us, like you know, right, armies on horses and dragons and swords and stuff. But for them, that was real. And it's really just meant to be a comfort in difficult times. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, do you think any part of the physical depiction of Jesus in this passage is literally accurate? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's... It's a great question, and you can't really ever be sure about that, can we? I mean, it's definitely true that even though God is a spiritual being, he doesn't have a physical form. We know that when he, in the incarnation, when the God the Son incarnated human flesh became Jesus, that he forever has a human form. Uh, whether Jesus looks like he did, you know, in his 30s and remains that way, or the, a glorified Jesus would have, like, white hair instead of brown, I don't know. I'm, but I, I imagine, you know, in the sense we think of a glorified body, that that shining kind of like boldness uh, that does kind of come through here. I think that's something to anticipate and expect. Yeah, there are some token elements that I think would definitely, like if it says that his belt was gold, it wouldn't be red, for example, or something like that, right? Perhaps, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't recognize him. <laughs> All right, well, the last question is, Actually, we have two more. What is the danger of focusing only on Jesus as a friend or teacher and not on him as the righteous judge? I think the first part about it is, is um, you know, you need to know who, who God is. If you have a relationship with him, you don't have, it's like imagine a relationship with another person. You know, you don't have a, a real, in-depth, impactful, true, I think, relationship if you only relate to them on this one facet that works for you and you ignore the rest of the person. That's really phony. And the relationship with God is the exact same. If it's just this one facet of who he is, are you really in a relationship with the real living God, treating him kind of like this cardboard cutout? Uh, so I think that's a big danger. And if we don't have that real relationship with God, um, then I think the question then is, you know, do we, if we're, are we saved? Do we truly have that? That's the big thing. Know your God. And, 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 and then on the other hand, of course, when it comes to our faithfulness, 
you know, that discipleship is a great term that we like to use because disciple and master, that relationship typifies that submission and authority. And the friend relationship doesn't. So it's always good to remind ourselves when we are walking in the narrow path of, of our faith, we have to be pulled back, we have to be corrected, and we have to be open to receive correction. And so understanding this aspect of, of God is important. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So there's one more question that just came in. And this kind of fits into uh, when we were talking about audience. And you said that uh, it wasn't exactly written for us. And we tend to all be self-centered and think that everything <laughs> revolves around us. We're in the middle. Um, and we sometimes over-spiritualize things. But having said that, would you say that we can try to imagine how we can map that imagery in revelations to what's happening in the world today. In other words, um, is there anything that we can take from this book and actually pinpoint it to events going on today and say, well, actually, this was prophesied in this book, or should we avoid that altogether? Well, uh, yeah, I, I would say to avoid doing that. I think that's the most important thing to do. Um, because the church has, there have been people within the church for 2,000 years that have done that, and every time in their circumstances it was like the end of the world, they were surrounded by armies, they were about to be tortured or whatever, and like, oh, here's the end of the world, and then poof, it didn't happen. Uh, and that affects our witnessing as well in the world. Like, are you gonna believe someone who just told you it was this and it wasn't? I mean, we're not, we're not God and we don't know. But this book was, is, even though it was written for people at a certain time, they weren't at the end, and it was written for them. And therefore, we can see that it can be as just as useful for us, no matter where we're at, because that situation of persecution that we see in Revelation is always present to some extent, and the response that God is calling Christians to at the end of, at the, at the end of days is the same in every step in that direction. So uh, the truth and the meaning and the purpose that we get from it doesn't change and is absolutely 100% useful for us today. So. Yeah, I, I remember uh, we talked about that a little bit, about how um, Revelation kind of prepares us, like, no matter what era we're born into, and in how history repeats itself, and a lot of the themes covered there, they're applicable. There are a lot of situations that are seem apocalyptic. Like, we can very much be tempted right now to think that, like, we are living in end times, and like you said, that happened many times in history but it doesn't mean that we can't use still this truth right now to strengthen ourselves and look Ab at it. Yeah. Absolutely, because you're right, those scenes always look like that throughout history, so it's, it's definitely very useful for us to have. Part of the reason why we're going through it as a church now, too, so. Yeah. 